We need it. The community needs it. Please fill it out. Would you stand as we continue to sing this morning? Jesus, draw me ever nearer as I labor through the storm. You have called me to this passage, and I'll follow though I May this journey bring a blessing. says, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my trust and my hope in him. And it is indeed in Christ alone where we have our only secure hope. And we can sing that as believers this morning. Let's join together. In Christ alone my hope is found is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Love of Christ, I stand. Sing there in the ground, his body lay. There in the ground, his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. There bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine born with the precious blood of Christ in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath.
breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Beautiful morning. It's a great day to be in God's house. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah, Jesus. We just thank you for allowing us to be here today, for allowing us to gather to worship you, to hear a message from you, to have our lives changed so that we can walk more like you. So be with us today, Lord, as we start this new chapter life of Faith in Church. Help us to uh, tear down our altar poles and tear down our idols and bust up those old altars that are not for you. Help us to seek your, your word. Help us to uh, seek your face so that we might be glorified in the church in Christ. We thank you now for these offerings that are brought today. We just pray that you take them and multiply them. Amen and good morning. I cannot put into words how thankful I am to be here this morning. And so I just want to tell you uh, that I'm thanking the Lord 
that I can be a part of this worship service this morning and be a part of this church family. I want to invite you to grab your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one in the pew in front of you and find the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is the first book in what we call the New Testament. And I do like to encourage people all the time, never hesitate if you need to use your table of contents to find where we're going to be for our passage. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. I do want to say uh, just a general thank you to all of the church family and certainly many specific individuals. I won't name names because I wouldn't want to embarrass anyone or forget anyone, but uh, the Lord has used this church to make me and my family feel very welcome to Chapin Baptist in so many ways, in big ways and small ways, and we're very, very thankful for that. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to begin a journey together through the book of Matthew. Now, when I was being interviewed, one of the things that I made sure uh, was clear that a priority I have is that we will have a general pattern of preaching through books of the Bible. And so we're going to begin a journey through the book of Matthew. So we're going to be focusing on Matthew for quite a while. I don't know how long, but it will be quite a while. And we may take a break here and there just to kind of break it up so it doesn't feel too monotonous over time. But I would encourage you guys to maybe begin reading through Matthew, begin pondering the book as a whole, using it as your devotional reading, so on and so forth, and be praying the Lord will bless us through this specific book and his word. So with that being said, I want to read the very first verse. We're going to cover verses 1 through 17 this morning. I want to read verse 1 and then have prayer. It says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's pray. God, we thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning to gather together as your people, to worship you by singing praises to your name, by hearing from your word. Lord, I thank you for this text this morning. I ask that you would use your word to speak into our lives. And may we, may we listen to what you have to say to us. May we see what you want to show us. Lord, I, I know that right now we all have various needs, various worries, various concerns or distractions that, that might keep our focus away. I pray that you would, by grace, just bless us to soak in your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to try to cover quite a bit of ground, so I just want to hit the ground running. I want to make sure what we're going to do is we're going to start slowly. We're going to focus a few minutes on verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2, and then we're going to walk through this genealogy. Now, I know that when people think of the Bible being a boring book, a lot of times they think of a passage such as this. The genealogy. My dad asked me the other day, he said, what are you going to preach on? I said, Matthew 1. He goes, the begats? I said, yes, the begats. And I've heard people say, oh, the Bible is so boring. It's begat this, begat that. And and so, yes, I'm beginning with this passage, but I want to tell you, it's anything but boring. And I do pray that that, uh, while I'm not trying to entertain, I pray that I do my job to make sure we realize this is far from a boring passage of Scripture. And I can't help but think that if the Holy Spirit saw fit to begin the New Testament with these verses, it's certainly fit for us to begin a new chapter of ministry together as well. So, verse 1 again, let's look here. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, this is simply one verse. It's very few words, and yet there's so much in it. And what I want to do is just focus for a couple minutes on all of the information, all of the insight in this one verse to kind of propel us into the genealogy. So first, I want to note something. When Matthew says the book of the genealogy, he literally begins this book with two words, and I want to read them out to you as they're written down in Greek, and I want you to listen to them and see if they might sound familiar And then I'll kind of lead us into an understanding of really there's this interesting notion going on. This is what he says. He says, Biblos Geneseos. Okay? 
I'm going to say that again. I want you to hear, maybe especially in the first word if it sounds familiar, Biblos Geneseos. Now, the word Biblos is the word for book. It's where we get the word Bible. I want you to think about that. It's the very first word in this book is Biblos. Now, Geneseos, that sounds funny, I'm sure. Let me say it a different way. It's not a proper translation, but it might sound familiar to us. Geneseos. Does that sound a little more familiar? Biblos, Geneseos. Genesis. The idea of a beginning. The the root of that word, this word gen, or or as we might say it, gen, it's all throughout chapter 1. And and this, this phrase is translated book of the genealogy, but I can't help but wonder if we're also supposed to hear this echo, this thought of this is a a new beginning. This is a new Bible genesis taking place right here. God is doing something new. It's the book of the genealogy. It's the genesis in the Bible of Jesus Christ. And that phrase, Jesus Christ, I want us to think about that for a minute. It's not a first and last name. My name is Michael Hull. Jesus' name was Jesus His title was the Christ. Matthew is saying this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the Christ. The name Jesus is very similar. It's a rendering almost of the name Joshua from Hebrew. It means the Lord is my salvation. Or as one scholar put it, it's almost as if the name says, Lord, help. And we'll see next week, Lord willing, that the name Jesus is very intentional because The angel says he's going to save his people from their sins. And so this name, Jesus, gives us a sense of salvation in God, and he is the Christ. Your version may say the Messiah. It means the anointed one. So already Matthew is reminding his readers that he's talking about one who has been promised, that there would come one day an anointed one, a redeemer, about whom we just sang about the Redeemer. He is promised. He is the Christ. And Matthew is saying he is Jesus. He says he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, David and Abraham are not Jesus' father and grandfather. Matthew is being very selective here. He's picking out two key people in the history of God's people, King David, and Abraham. So right off the bat, we're realizing that Matthew wants us to look at Jesus the Christ and see that he has something to do with the royal line of Israel's king, which is why he mentions David, and that he also has this completely Jewish heritage according to faith that Abraham embodied. And so that's a lot of information just in one verse that is going to propel us into this genealogy. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with Abraham, and, and we're going to walk through, uh, through quickly at some points, and then we're going to take time out to other points. And as I read it, I want you to pay attention to when the pattern is broken. Okay, this genealogy is going to have a pattern, a refrain, a familiar cadence, and yet it's going to break a few times. I'm going to try to point them out. And I want us to pay attention to the breaks in those patterns. So first, he says, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Don't panic. We're not going to go this slowly through it. But I want us to take a time out, and I want us to catch up with Matthew. Matthew begins with Abraham. Abraham was not the first man in the world. So Matthew's being very selective. He begins with Abraham. What I want to do is I want to draw our attention all the way to the beginning in Genesis 12. If you want to find Genesis 12, feel free. If not, that's fine. We are going to look at a few other places outside of our main text this morning. First, we're going to look at Genesis 12. Now, note this. Genesis 1 through 11, creation, the fall into sin, that's them eating the fruit serpent has deceived Adam and Eve into eating fruit. Sin comes into the world, and the world becomes an absolute mess. And God could have 
wiped it away. He could have been done with it. The flood takes place. Noah, that whole story. Still sin is marring the world. Again, God have got, could have gotten rid of the whole thing, but he doesn't. He, in a sense, begins anew in Genesis 12. Now, this was no surprise to God. But in Genesis 12, you do have a sense of a new beginning. It's almost as if redemptive history is hitting a key milestone. And I want to read to you what happens in Genesis 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, now Abram is Abraham. His name is lengthened later. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I could not help but kind of uh, relate here. I, I just left my hometown, just left my family, and I went to where the Lord showed me, so I resonate to a degree with Abram here. If you take notes in your Bible, you may want to underline the word house. That's going to echo a couple times today. You may want to underline the word land. He says, I want you to go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In verse 4 it says, So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I am stressed out at 38 moving. I cannot imagine what Abraham has felt at 75. Verse 5, Abraham or Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land, the promised land. Matthew begins his genealogy with Abraham because he wants to draw his readers back to the very beginning of God doing something through a specific people. And we're reminded that Abraham was given promises. He was promised land. He was promised that God would make him a great nation, that he would bless him, that he would make his name great. And back in Matthew, he says, Abraham was the father of Isaac. And I want you to know that right there shows that God is the God of miracles who will fulfill his promises. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. You do your math, that means he had to wait 25 years for the very first promise to be fulfilled, to have a descendant. And now in Matthew, we see this long list of Abraham's descendants. We worship a God who fulfills his promises. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. There's a break in the pattern right there. Matthew's pointing out Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. His brothers, they were to become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. God is putting his people together, and Matthew's reminding us of that. Verse 3, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. There's another break in the pattern. Tamar is a woman. That's a mother. Very rare for a woman to appear in a genealogy in this day and age. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, another mom. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, here comes a huge break in the pattern, the father of David, the king. Matthew wants us to know something very specific about David. He was the king. Now, they know who David was. And I bet most of us know who David was. He was the king. 
want you to think about this. This is now proof that God has continued to fulfill his promises to Abraham. By the time David came around, they had finally moved into the promised land, settled, had victory over their enemies. Whoever cursed them, God cursed, and God was blessing them under David's leadership. God is doing his work. And when we stop here and take a time out at David, we need to be reminded of another very significant promise that God made his people. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading, and I want you to see how there's, this is another dialogue where God is telling God's man about a promise, a covenant, very similar to what he did with Abram. 2 Samuel 7, verse 1, it says, Now when the king lived in his house, that's David, And the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. See how God's been fulfilling his promise. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. In other words, I have a nice house. God's living in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. This is ironic because that's not what God would have wanted to do. Verse 4 says, But the same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. He says, I will make for you a great name. It's just what he told Abraham. Like the name of the great ones of the earth. Verse 10 I will appoint a place, it's a land promise, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. Violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, this is where God's promise is expanded. It's been echoing and now it's expanding. Moreover, I will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I shall establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But... My steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So God echoed his promises to Abram. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to make you secure. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a name, a great name. And he expands it, and he says, I'm going to give you a kingdom, and your throne shall be established forever. And when Matthew gets in his genealogy to Jesse, the father of David, the king, we see God all this time has been fulfilling his promises. But it takes a very sharp turn. Just four chapters later, we see David Not where he was supposed to be. Supposed to be at war, he was not. And it says in verse 6, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Some of you may know that is Bathsheba. And you may recall the story of Bathsheba. Just four chapters after God made his covenant with David, David commits adultery with Bathsheba. He commits murder against Uriah. And God says to him, I want you to listen to what God says. 
This is in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. God says, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. It takes a sharp, tragic turn for God's people. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And now we have a list of kings. I want you to know as I list these names out, these kings by and large show the absolute sinful nature of humanity. Very few highlights. Many of these men are described as being evil in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 7, And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and stop right there. We're hearing king after king after king. And if you go and you read these stories in First and Second Kings, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. God's people are unfaithful. It says in verse 11, And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers. There's another break in the pattern. Now we've already seen this phrase, and his brothers. Judah and his brothers, a reminder that God was putting together the people of Israel. And here we see this phrase, Jeconiah and his brothers, and it's far from putting people together. Look what's happening at the time of the deportation to Babylon, the exile. This is the time when God's people are now being removed from the land. They're being scattered. In 2 Kings 24, we see that God's people are seized by King Nebuchadnezzar. And I just want you to listen to a couple of verses. Listen to this. It says, Because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judea that he cast them out from his presence. God had promised to gather his people, to secure them in their land, and to dwell with them. And now we see, as a result of their unfaithfulness, he has cast them out of his presence. And then I want you to hear the description of what the king of Babylon did to Jerusalem. It says in chapter 25, verse 9, he burned the house of the Lord. There's that word house again. God had promised a house to Abraham, to David. He had given them a house. And now the Babylonian Empire is burning the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. It took a very tragic turn. And then it, it sort of resolves by saying this. This is verse 21, 2 Kings 25. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land, removed from the promised land. That's what sin does. Sin makes it impossible for people to dwell in the presence of God. Did you think about your sin this morning? Did you think that your sin is enough to make it impossible for you to be able to enter the presence of God in your own merit? Things took a tragic turn for us all when sin entered the world. What's God going to do? The title of this sermon is, Who Do You Think? He is. Who do you think Jesus is? Well, what we're about to do is really think hard about who this Jesus is, and it matters because of our sin. Because we do not deserve to be in the presence of God. We don't deserve to gather here and worship and claim to be in God's presence and claim to be God's people. We deserve punishment. We deserve exile. But let's see what God does. Matthew 1, verse 12. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, 
of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. This is not a boring passage. This is a passage that should fill us with hope, should make us see that God is the God who fulfills His covenant promises. We are watching a summary of redemptive history. And Matthew is showing us that redemptive history culminates in the coming of this one baby. Jesus, the Lord is my salvation, who is called Christ the Messiah. And I want you to look at verse 17 to see how Matthew finishes his introduction. He says, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Three times he mentions this number 14. And I'll admit, this is a very peculiar verse. Lots of opinions. Lots of speculation about what Matthew's trying to accomplish here. So, what I'm about to share is, is uh, I don't have this written in concrete. There may be more insight, but I want to share the sense of what I think Matthew is doing here. I want to teach you about two things that were uh, used in writing and literature in this day. Number one was the repetition of three. We sing a song called Holy, Holy, Holy. That's a song that's echoed in, in heaven over and over again. Holy, Holy, Holy. That was the Hebrew way of saying the holiest of holy. It was the way of doing the superlative. Three times David mentions the number 14. 14, 14, 14. What does that mean? Well, one suggestion that I think is helpful is that he's using a technique where the letters in the Hebrew alphabet are assigned numerical value. The letters for the name David, essentially D, V, D, add up to 14. David, David, David. What does he call David in verse 6? The king. This is Jesus, the Christ. He's the king. He's the king. He's the king. He's the king of kings. Who do you think he is? I want you to know who he is. Jesus Christ is the king. Chapin Baptist Church Jesus Christ is your king. I want to say to every single person in here, Jesus, the Messiah, is your king. Now note this. I'm not asking you, is he your king? I'm not making this subjective. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't ask if Jesus is your king. The Bible tells you, Jesus is is your king. Whether you like it or not, Jesus is the king. The Bible has the message for the world. Jesus is the king of kings. Whether he's rejected by someone or not, he's still the king. Oh, if we fix our eyes on the king of kings, it's the most important thing we can do. It's always tempting for a new pastor to come in and start to share vision and strategy and plans and so on and so forth. And there will be some of that. But the first thing we need to do is look at Jesus, our King. And so by way of application, I, I just want to ask you, not is He your King? By the authority of God's Word, I'm telling you He is your King. But I want to ask you, are you submitting to his reign? Are you submitting to his rule in your life? Now, you, you may have walked in here rejecting the claims of Christ. I want to let you know you have an opportunity today to submit to his reign. He is your king, and you can submit to him. You can receive him. You can confess that like these men and women we see in this genealogy, that you are riddled with your own sinfulness and that you deserve to be removed from the land, so to speak. And yet you can today claim him as your king. 
and you'll see that his name is Jesus, salvation, and he will save you from your sins. If you are in that state of being unsaved, unconverted to Christ, I implore you, consider him today. You have an opportunity to turn to him. Many others who are already Christians in here, I want you to think about these men and women we read about. I want you to think about Abraham. He is our father in the faith. God may be calling you just to step deeper into your faith in Jesus as your king. I want you to think of David, a man that had such a high calling and took such a hard fall, yet he is described as the man after God's own heart. Maybe right now you know that God has called you, has a calling on your life, and you're aware of your own sinfulness. You need to turn to him. I want you to know that just like David experienced, you can repent and receive mercy and grace. Certainly we're all like these kings listed one after the other after the other, and in our own right, we're, we're simply evil before the Lord. We need his mercy. I want to point out one thing. These women mentioned this genealogy. They serve a huge purpose. I don't know if you know the story of Tamar. I encourage you to go read it. You don't want to read it when children are around. Go read Genesis 38 and think about the fact that that story, in essence, has made it into Jesus' genealogy. I don't know if you know the story of Rahab. She was a prostitute. You may or may not know the story of Ruth. She was an outsider. Bathsheba isn't even mentioned by name because of the scandal associated with what took place between her and David. And here's what we learned about our king. I'll tell you the kind of king he is. He's a king of grace who brings in the outsiders. He brings in the downtrodden. He brings in the outcast. He uses them for his purpose. We all belong in that category. I want you to know, you may be struggling with feeling accepted by Jesus. You may be struggling with thinking, would he ever love you? Would he he ever take note of you? I want you to know he loves you. Let me tell you how he proved it. He proved it by being a king unlike any other king. You see, next week we'll look at the birth of Jesus Christ. This king was born in a very humble setting. He did not come into the world that they would have expected Messiah King to come. He did not live the kind of life they expected him to live. He was humble. He spent time with the humble. He taught truth. He opposed the religious elite. He performed miracles. He went and he died on the cross. And I want you to think about this. Right before he was killed, the people of God are asked, what do you want me to do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Just as he's labeled here. And the people said, crucify him. Crucify him. Jesus is the kind of king who is willing to die for you and for me on the cross. He's the kind of king who conquered the grave. He is the king of kings. He he reigns at the Father's side. And I want to finish simply by reading this. This is from Philippians. I want you to know this. Whether you have received Christ or not, whether you accept him as your king or not, I want you to know this. You will bow your knee before him one day. I recommend doing it sooner rather than later. I recommend you walk into fellowship with him while you have time to experience his love and his grace. Listen to this. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. It's above Abram's name. It's above David's name. It is the name above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God is transcending the original promises. It's not just a promised land. It's heaven, earth, and under the earth. Christ is King. We are all going to bow before him in eternity. I implore you, if you have not, today, bow before him as your Lord. And church family, be thinking right now as we close, be thinking, how does God want you to submit to Jesus' reign this morning. 
in little things and in big things. How does God, how does Jesus want you right now to admit to him, okay, Jesus, you're the king and I'm not. We all day in, day out try to be our own king, try to be our own queen. We try to rule our own lives and we're not in charge. Jesus is. He wants to be in charge of every facet of your life. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to have a time of response. And here's how I would like these times of response to go week to week. They'll have a variety at times. But typically, I always want us to know we have a time to respond to Jesus in worship, in confession, in repentance, in prayer. If you need to, come forward. You can turn these steps into a prayer altar, and you can just pray to the Lord as you see fit. If you see someone coming up to pray, I would encourage you, maybe you walk up, put your hand on their shoulder, pray over your brother or sister. Just pray for them silently. You may have a specific prayer need. You want to come to to me or to one of the other pastors or someone else. You might want to speak to your neighbor and just say, I need prayer in this situation. I need Jesus to be the king in this aspect of my life. If you have not received Christ before, I want you to know you can come down and I would love to meet you talk with you, hear what you have on your heart, pray with you, and begin a process of walking through the gospel with you. So let's respond as we feel the Lord calling us. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have a plan. You have a a design for history, and we've walked through a summary of it, and we see that your history culminated in Jesus the Christ. We simply say, Jesus, you are our king. Forgive us where we have not submitted our need to your reign in every detail of our life. Lord, I pray that if there are any in here who came in rejecting you, that they would receive you today. And you are the king of kings. Do your work in our lives. Be be the clear sovereign in our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. to read to you again from Philippians 2, almost as a benediction as we close. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven 
and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God bless you.